Welcome back to Mastara for the penultimate product review because there's only one book I haven't reviewed after this one and then we're freestyling it from then on. Today's offering is I Am 2 The Wrath of Olympus. I'm going to be talking more about the significance of the module on the Mastara setting than the module itself because it's a kind of average module and that would be boring. It's not a popular module, none of the immortal modules really were, but in terms of background on immortal interaction in their daily lives, it's one of the most significant modules in the Mastara setting. So get ready to oil yourselves down and talk like Steve Reeves. I'm Mr. Welch and we're looking at Wrath of Olympus. The module was written by Robert J. Blake back in 87. It's the second of the three IM series of modules. Keith Parkinson did the cover art, while George Barr did the interior art. The module is noted for being quite different from the Immortal Storm, with the focus being on Mastara itself instead of constant plane hopping. Don't get me wrong, you're going to be traveling to multiple planes, but all the main action towards the end is on the Prime Material plane. Continuity-wise, the module is a total mess. It directly co uh, contradicts the previous module by giving us new hierarchs and adding previously unknown immortals to the mix of the positions and power. Nyx is now replaced by Knight. Uh, Dejia is replaced with Terra at the top of the matter uh, heap. It keeps with the style of the Immortal Storm with the party being summoned from different spheres and getting sent on a MacGuffin hunt, so it's not that different from the previous module in that aspect. The module is most notable because it goes into some depth on how Mastara can have immortals with the name of gods from other settings. Specifically, this module features the immortal Orcus, who, of course, is the demon lord of undead in Faerun or Orth. The module showcases how this can happen wonderfully because that's actually the plot of the story itself. The basic premise is some low-level immortals decided they were tired of being low-level immortals, and after traveling the plains and discovering the Greek pantheon, went masquerading as Zeus, Ares, Hephaestus, and uh, so forth. So this precedent explains not just Orcus, but how Mustara can have Thor, Odin, Loki, Demogorgon, and Bastet, and yet have no gods. The immortals are imposters. Mustara's Orcus was originally Oragus, a warlord from Long Dead Tomorrow. Only after he obtained immortality and walked through the multiverse like he owned the place did he actually encounter Orcus, and Oragus realized that Orcus, the demon prince of the undead, was a way cooler title than Oragus, the immortal warlord from a Long Dead nation. Plus, Demon Lord of the Undead has a lot more mnemonic charm than trying to remember exactly where Tamora used to be. So this means immortals are running around in the plains as superpowered mortals in other settings. This gives you tons of opportunity. You could have Koratiko going to toilet paper Elminster's house. You can find Nobnar attempting to drink Karamon and Flint Fireforge under the table while they're trying to figure out exactly what he is. Vanya might take a vacation on Greyhawk to leave a mercenary faction in one of their countless border flare-ups just for fun. The module gives an opportunity to have the Immortals make cameos in other settings. If you happen to be playing Immortals, might as well go troll some of the other settings since their Immortals are stuck being Immortals while you get to be plane hopping demigods. Now the reverse isn't true. Mastara Immortals guard the setting jealously. This aspect features heavily on the module itself. They will absolutely not tolerate people setting themselves as, up as gods even if they are actual e-gods. The Olympians try to set themselves up in Derekin as actual gods when they're just regular Immortals and the rest of the Immortals bring down the hammer quickly. Creatures from the Outer Plains also face a lot of opposition from the Immortals, so gods, celestials, demons, devils, and similar creatures aren't going to be found in Mastara very often because the Immortals do everything in their power to keep them out. Now, Immortals might not be as powerful as gods, but it's not by much, and there's a lot more Immortals than gods that would dare trespass. If the real Orcus would show up with a demon army in tow to express his displeasure against the imposter Orcus, then all the Immortals from all the spheres would show up in kind. Orcus might be a god-level demon, but against a hundred Immortals ranging in power from barely demigod to just a hair shy of a greater god, Orcus isn't going to be having a good day. The lawful Celestials and uh, Devils might have a side deal with the Immortals, may like maybe a passport system. Them. While the demons don't care and take their chances, though if they get caught they're going to get squished. I know the lawful neutral chaotic alignment system doesn't mesh well with lawful evil demons, but if you were expanding the multiverse's interaction with Mastara, it's not a bad explanation. The module is fairly typical for an immortal adventure, including coming to a point where you have to turn into a mortal creature to finish the adventure. In this case, it's long dead heroes from Mastara's past. You run around, you chase the MacGuffin across various weird planes until you get back to the Prime Material plane. Part of the module has a Greek theme, but not so much as, say, the Millennium Scepter. you got to fight atop Mount Olympus against demons where you get play the ancient heroes, along with several uh, severely weakened Olympians fighting alongside you. Other than that, the adventure is really average. It's just another stock immortal adventure that really doesn't provide anything amazing to play. So while the module doesn't break any new ground for player characters, but for Mastara lore, it's one of the best. It gives an established pecking order for the Immortals, and a wonderful example is how the Immortals police each other. The Olympian Immortals overstep their bounds big time, and they get smacked down hard. 
This happens at the beginning of the module. They lose power in the immortal tiers of the hierarchy, though in the course of the module the entropic immortals try to destroy the Olympians permanently. The module is hampered by requiring one of the spheres of power in the party, but that's rather strict. What if the party had two players that follow the same path of immortality? If the party had two dwarves, they tend to follow the sphere of matter for obvious reasons. That was just another part of the module that can be ignored. Finding the module is pretty easy. An original copy is about 25 bucks on eBay and other auction sites. There's a few people that want double that, but they can keep wanting that. The module is beefy at 54 pages, but immortal level adventures were largely dis designed outside the scope of D&D. You're a demigod. You're not going into many dungeons, and you're going to obliterate most dragons. You're beyond the scale of the original game by now, and that turns off a lot of players. The PDF will cost you 5 bucks. There's a POD version for 10 bucks as well. You might not play at the immortal level, but the module is more useful to you as a source ma uh, material than an actual adventure, so you should pick it up if possible. So that concludes Wrath of the Olympus. The name itself is misleading because you aren't dealing with actual Greek gods, but it does give you a huge insight on how the immortals police themselves, and don't like it when immortals decide to directly rule over mortals. Next week is the last Mastara module I haven't covered, Best of Intentions. It's a murder mystery in a setting where the players are, in fact, immortal. I'm trying to catch the attention of Wizards of the Coast, so like and subscribe because they like sites with big numbers. I'll throw the, the Twitter on there as well so you can uh, follow there. I always throw something up and try it at least once a day. If Mastar is going to come back, we've got to show that it's still a popular setting, which isn't hard because it is. So until next time, hard to believe we're almost done, isn't it?